morning. It's great to be with you this morning. Um, maybe spring is around the corner. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but this morning, I, I thought that we would study together about something that all of us uh, experience and see if we can find a, a biblical way to deal with it. And that's the idea of uncertainty. You know, uncertainty, uncertainty is something that often paralyzes us. If you think back uh, what seems to be a lot of years ago now, but still fresh in our minds, when terrorists flew American planes into buildings on the morning of September 11th, the nation entered a period of uncertainty. In fact, the uncertainty was so great that all of the airplanes in the U.S. stopped operation for two days. Every airline, every plane, every passenger was grounded. America was paralyzed with uncertainty. And really, uncertainty affects every part of life. Uncertainty in the financial market creates recessions. Uncertainty in the housing market creates what we call a housing crisis. Uncertainty in our health or in your future or your job can completely paralyze you. And in those situations, as we think through those things, sometimes we often have no idea what it is that we should do. Often when we face uncertainties, rather than making bold decisions or rather than enjoying life, we become anxious, we become fearful. And, you know, there, there's a phrase in a song that I like that, that says, you know, certainly uncertainty uh, is something that all of us can, can recognize or that is a part of all of our lives. The uncertainties of life can paralyze us. So how do we deal with those things? Well, you know, the reality, um, that reality of uncertainty is actually addressed several times in the book of Ecclesiastes. In chapter 11, for instance, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but here Solomon, as he goes through some of those things, recognizes that life is full of uncertainties. And he continues to remind us that there are things that we just don't know. And when you look there in chapter 11, I don't have that one on the screen or anything, but in chapter 11 he says several times as he's talking about different things that we don't know something, and that's just something that we have to deal with sometimes as far as uncertainties go. In chapter 2 he, he says there that, uh, chapter verse 2, rather, of chapter 11, he says, you know not what disaster may happen on earth. As you go down through there in verse, in verse 5, he says twice there, there is something that we, not, that we do not know. In verse 6, he talks about the, that we don't know the uncertainties of life. But being paralyzed for, with fear, however, is not really an option for Solomon. In fact, as you continue to read through chapter 11 and into chapter 12, he encourages us to do the very opposite of being paralyzed by uncertainty, uncertainty, but rather he encourages us to take action, to make choices, and to, to live life. And so what would motivate a person then to do that in such an uncertain world? You know, Solomon makes a shift in chapter 11 from discussing the uncertainties of life to discussing th some things that are certain, and those certainties are things that, that God has ordained. And we want to talk about that this morning as we think about the certainty of God. Certainly uncertainties can be unsettling, um, but we want to think about what the certainty is as we look towards God. That that's where we can ground ourselves, and that's where we can make good decisions. And as the Solomon goes on into, into chapter 12... And, and thinks about that, you know, that it's helpful to view Ecclesiastes as a commentary on life after, uh, meaning after the fall. Solomon wants to remind his readers that what it's like, life is like outside of the Garden of Eden. It's fallen, it's unsatisfying, it's futile. But the futility of life still can have a purpose and to point our attention toward our Creator and offer meaning in Him. He says in, in verse 1 of chapter 12, remember your Creator. In the days of your youth, before evil days have come, and the years draw near, in which you will say, I have no pleasure in him. He says to ground ourselves in the certainty of God. And I want to think about that with you this morning as we kind of consider some of those things together um, and appreciate what the certainties, uh, what the certainty of God is, and how that can help us through these difficult times of the uncertainty of life. 
So, you know, I mentioned we deal with that. And so as we, as we think about that, consider that the Bible teaches us about that as well, as we talk about the different uncertainties that we face. And if we appreciate where we are with those, it helps us then be grounded in the certainty of God. We don't always know what is coming next in life. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 21, the writer there tells us very simply, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but the purpose of the Lord, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And as I think about that, you know, we see Old and New Testament examples of that, that, you know, we often look at things and, and we have designs, we have plans for what we're going to do, and there's not something wrong with that, but sometimes we're very shaken when those things change, or sometimes we don't consider God in those things that we're making plans about, and then uncertainty kicks in, uh, and we find ourselves in situations that we didn't want to be in. James talks about it this way as he writes about uh, the, this very thing that we always don't know, we don't always know what's coming next. He says in verse 13 of chapter 4, says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will we go into such and such a town and spend a year and, and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. And I appreciate his thought there. You know, he's, he's offering this to, to them as a rebuke. But think about the principle that we see here. Because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And we talk about that a lot. And sometimes we use that even in an invitation or a Bible lesson saying, you know, we may not be here tonight when we assemble again. Or we may not be here tomorrow. And we look at that kind of flippantly sometimes or haphazardly. But the reality of it is... We have probably all known people that, that came to a sudden end or their life changed immediately when they weren't thinking that it would. And James tells us to consider that. He says, what is your life? It is a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And here's the advice that he gives us if we're, gonna, if we're going to deal with uncertainty. He says, instead, you ought to say this if the Lord wills. We will do this or that. Now, I don't think James means here that you have to actually utter the, the, that word every time you make a decision or a thought. It's not a bad idea. But his idea here is that you have that mindset, that you're trying to follow God's will in what you do. And in those things, then, as, as we'll see even later in the lesson, you can be certain you can have purpose. Um, and, and that's how we ought to look at things and deal with uh, the fact that of the uncertainty that, that, that comes about us. So as you consider that, you know, also consider this, that we often do things like plan and prepare and suppose and expect, and then sometimes things go differently. Back to Ecclesiastes, what does the writer tell us there? What does the preacher say in verse 11 of chapter 9? He says, again, I saw under the sun the races not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. I think if you've been around for any amount of time, you can certainly see that that is happening. Things don't always happen the way that you expect that they will in physical life. And, you know, the writer here gives lots of examples of that, that sometimes it doesn't work out that way. All of us are victims of time and chance. And that can be good, that can be bad. Um, we can be on, the, on either side of that. And he says there in verse 12, For man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an eagle net, and birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. And, you know, his, his point there is just that we don't know as we live this life that, that God has set in motion sometimes what is going to happen. We'll see as we go through this lesson that we can trust in the certainty of God with certain things and principles. But day-to-day -day life, we need to realize that that's, that's going to happen sometimes. And, you know, Jesus talked about it in this parable in Luke chapter 12, um, which I think is, is something we ought to all remind ourselves of, of some time. He says there in Luke 12 and verse 16, he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this and tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool. Now, you stop there for a moment and think, you know, is, is God upset because the man was prosperous? Is God upset because he did well with what he had? I don't think that's the, the point there. Um, you know, I, I have a job. I have a family to provide for. I try to do well. And I hope that I will. Maybe I'll get a bonus this year. Um, 
that's not the point here. I think the point is, anytime you see the word fool used, particularly in the New Testament, and usually in the Old, it's talking usually about someone who has not regarded God in their thinking. And, and that's the point here that, that's being made. This person didn't think about God and his purposes. All he thought about was himself. It's not wrong to prosper. It's not wrong to be rich. It's not wrong to have the things of this world. But he didn't think about God. He wasn't considering those, those plans that he could have done. And so, you know, he planned, he prepared, he supposed, he expected, and things went differently, didn't they? Uh, look what it says there. This night your, your soul will be required of you, and then who will all these things be? Is basically what he says there. That we ought to lay out for ourselves treasure in heaven. So even in these first few thoughts, as we think about uncertainty, and the things don't always go the way that, that maybe we wish they would, or hope they would, or plan that they would, think about how we ought to handle our lives. Um, and that the certainty of God is going to be important to us. So what should we do? when life doesn't go like we thought that it would. Well, the psalmist says in verse 46, chapter 46 and verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The, the point of that verse is there for us to appreciate that in a world of uncertainty, in a world where things may constantly change and they may not go as we expect, there is an unchanging that we can have certainty in, that we can have comfort in, that we can realize. And so, because of that, as Jesus tells those at the Sermon on the Mount, don't be anxious. Don't, don't be so concerned about the, the frail things that will change. That's what we need to do as we think about the uncertainty that, that we may experience day to day. He says in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 6, Therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life. What will you eat? What will you drink? What about your body? What will you put on? Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? You know, and he's just finished talking about how God takes care of, of even the, the lilies of the field and, and the birds of the air. And so as we consider that, what do we need to do then? As the proverb writer said in Proverbs 3 and verse 5, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. He says, rather, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. And that's how we deal with the uncertainty of this life, and that's how we learn then to depend upon the certainty of God. The difference between that unstable bridge that was in the, the picture before that's leading off into the fog and we don't know where it's going, is it treacherous? Is, it, is something going to change? Yes. Or the rock that is our God. And God hasn't promised that everything is going to be just like we want it, but there are certain things that we can think about that we can have grounded certainty in. And, you know, one of the first ones to think about is the certainty of God's character. I think it's important to recognize that because if we're going to trust in something, what is it that we will put our trust in that, that is sure, that is solid, that is not going to move? And I think that we can see that, uh, we can see that in the character of God, that his character shows us that he desires good things for us. And I can... I can look at that and appreciate that, and I can appreciate even as I look at some of these verses and some of the ones we'll consider throughout the lesson, good things for me don't always mean that I'm going to have the best job or I'm going to have the most money or I'm going to have uh, the best health. Uh, I can pray and ask for those things, and God is gracious, and, and God hears the prayers of his saints, but sometimes what is best for me might be that I need to suffer a little in order to depend on God. Or it might be that I need to be taught to have some patience so that I can deal with another situation in life that might help someone else. It's, I will never be able to see the tapestry and the thread that God can see of everything that my life influences and touches. But one thing I can be certain about is God's character. He does desire good things for me. And that's evident by what we see through, throughout the scriptures. In Psalm 10, uh, and 103 in verse, uh, in verse 8, uh, notice what it says here about God and appreciate how that affects our lives. It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. And basically, when you look at these first few things, 
about God and that we can have certainty in his character, think about that in comparison to how we deal with other humans <laughs> in our lives. Um, some people are slow to anger, some people are not. And sometimes that changes depending on the situation. You know, when you think about the idea of, of being God being merciful and gracious, as I look through the Old and New Testament, and I see all of those who have come before God and, and dealt with him in one way or another, I can see that there are different characters. Let's take David as one example. David committed some of the same sins that some of the kings of Israel committed. And with David, God was well pleased, and with some of them, he was not. Why is that? God is merciful and gracious. Well, it's because of the heart that David had to continually <coughs> turn toward God. And that's what we want to think about. God's character is certain. If we are going to be, if we are going to be people who would give ourselves to his purpose and look to him, repent when we sin, turn toward him, we can always depend on the fact that he is merciful and gracious. And you think about the other things that the writer here says in Psalm in verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. You think about that the, in these psalms and in these passages, we mentioned this this morning in class, you know, the writers use things that we know or that we can comprehend to try to, <coughs> to, try to let us know the, the depth or the gravity or, or the immeasurable um, wealth of the treasures that come of God. I cannot probably with my finite mind appreciate how steadfast God's love is or how much it is there when I think about the sins of man. But I can appreciate how high the heavens are from the earth and realize that it's it's something that is fantastically great. Um, you know, and he uses these, these extremes to describe it. As far as the east is from the west, those are opposites. So far uh, does he remove our transgression from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. And, and the writer's just telling us there, God knows where we came from. He made us. And you think about the dust of the earth that formed man, and, and why are we alive? Why are we here? Because we have the breath of God in us. He breathed life into us. Certainly he cares for us. Certainly he desires good things for us. We can have certainty in that, 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 that God looks for good things in us. And we see that by what he did. Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly knew just what to do and when to do it that was for our benefit, for the benefit of all mankind. He says in verse 7, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It shows the certainty of his character, that he desires good things for us. So think about what else we see that shows us about God's character. That he is honorable, that he is true, he is a refuge. And we think about the idea of this rock and, and what some of the Psalms show us about that. In Psalm 18 and verse 30, uh, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true, he is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. You know, that may not mean as much to us as it did to the right, to those who it was written to at this time. But when you look back at history and you see some of the battles that they fought and how they defended themselves, you know, it wasn't satellite imagery and drones and, and weapons that they fired from a couple hundred miles away. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was face-to-face. -face. And how did you protect yourself? A great big shield. You had to be strong enough to carry it, first of all, for it to be able to be used as a defense. But you could get down behind that shield. You could hide behind it. Darts. Uh, spears that were coming at you if you used your shield properly that saved your life that's what kept you from dying on the battlefield and that's what he describes here that he is a shield you take refuge behind that shield and, and it's telling us God is honorable and true that he is there for us he desires what is good for us he wants to help us. And, and Jesus said it this way in Matthew 11. I, I like how you can find these concepts in both the Old Covenant and the, and the New. 
And they're the same thing. It shows us the certainty of God's character. Jesus says this. He says in verse 11, or chapter 11, rather, verse 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. First and foremost, he's talking about those who are doing God's work. Uh, it's the same concept that we saw a few verses ago and him being merciful and gracious. He is to those who are his and who are working for him and who are in him. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Come to me, all who labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's not be confused by, by what he's saying here, because sometimes people look at this and say rest, but, but yoke and, and labor, what's he talking about here? It's really quite simple when you think about, again, the language of the time. You know, how did they plow fields? How did they get things done? You know, they used oxen a lot of times, or, or other beasts of burden type animals, and how did they get the most out of them? They put a yoke on them so that they could do what? Not so that they could, you know, trap them down, so that they could pull together. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says, take my yoke, or take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is asking us to pull together with him. Be yoked to him. So we're going the same direction. We're doing the same work. And it's easier when we're locked together in step doing those things. And he says, if you'll do that, You'll, you'll find better uh, you'll find better fruitful things with your labor. Take my yoke and learn from me. Um, we see here that he is honorable and true. He's willing to work with us, that he can be our refuge in that way. We see that when we think about the certainty of God's character also, we see the fact that he is trustworthy and that he is reliable. We see peace in in being able to put our, our trust in that direction with God. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 9, it says very simply there, the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, and those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. I think we can certainly say, since we have the vantage point of history, and can look back through the history of the Old Testament and God's people and what he did for them and how he cared for them and how he helped them and then the promises that were made that are now fulfilled, that we can have confidence in the faithful of faithfulness of God, we can see that he is trustworthy. We can see that he is reliable. When you think of all the different directions that, that God could have gone, all the things that he did, how he stayed with his people, they sinned, he put them into captivity, he brought them back, just like he said that he would. He brought Jesus through that line, just like he said he would, just like he promised Abraham. And we live today in that age of the trustworthiness and the reliability that we see in God. And so that ought to help us understand how we can appreciate God's character. Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything give Prayer, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And when he says here, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds, where? In Christ Jesus. God fulfilled his promise. God gives us Christ. God helps us understand that, that we can depend upon him because his character is true. And I want you to be able to you know, appreciate that. Appreciate also the certainty of God's purpose. So we know what kind of character he has. Think about the purpose that he has as well. That I know that he has always had a purpose for me. There's a couple of verses that I'm going to use here to describe that, that, that sometimes I think get misinterpreted by people as we read them out of context. Uh, but, but appreciate what they mean when we look at, at some of these things. The first one's here in Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, and, and this gets quoted a lot in sermons about, you know, saying that God has plans for us. Um, and that, that he's looking out for our good. And that's true, and that's the principle that's here. I want you to appreciate that. But think about what has happened here. You go back to Jeremiah 29, and, and you read what has happened. He's told them, you know, they're going into captivity because of their sin. And it's, it's after he's talked about what's going to happen in Babylon that he says this in verse 29, because he's telling them he's going to bring them back out. He's not forsaking them. He's not leaving them. He's not writing them off because they sin. Why? Because he says, I, 
I know I have plans for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. He's telling them that because they're about to be carried off. For a future and a hope, there's going to be something that's coming. And so think about that as we think about that God has a purpose for us. Life may not go the way that we thought it would. I think all of us can probably say that in one, time, in one way or another. But God does care for us, and he has a purpose for us. And sometimes that purpose in life might be a physical life that isn't the greatest because it's a shining light to others of somebody who persevered for God. Maybe that's your purpose. Maybe your purpose is the, that you have an ability or an opportunity to proclaim his word. Maybe your purpose is to set a great example. Maybe your purpose is to lead other people to him. Uh, whatever it is, appreciate that he has plans for you. He says, he finishes that by saying, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. He's telling them they're going to be back. He's going to bring them back to Jerusalem and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And he goes on from there to describe how some of those things are going to happen. So we need to appreciate that. Appreciate that, that God has always had a purpose for us. I like how Paul Paul uh, says it here in, um, in, in, Acts the, in Acts chapter, I believe that's supposed to be 17, not uh, Acts chapter 7, the error the PowerPoint there. Uh, it says there, as Paul was talking about this uh, in Athens, when he walks into, this, into the city and, and he sees all the idols and the statues to so many different things and the one to the unknown God, and he decides, I'm going to talk about that one to you. And notice what he says in verse 24. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. <clears throat> Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So you start to appreciate the, the vastness and the greatness of this God, um, and that as wonderful as he is, as vast as he is, that he could create everything, that he could make everything, and you know. It, Think of the stars that they could see at that particular point in time. And, and as we look to the universe and think of all the vastness that is there, this is the God who made everything, but yet he has a purpose for me. That's really an amazing thought when you think about it. That of the, what now, seven and a half billion, I have lost count, people on earth, God knows who I am. He has a purpose for me. Though they may not be as many as yours, he knows the, the number of hairs on my head. I mean, it's just amazing to think about God in that way. And he goes on to say here, Paul says in verse 26, and he made from one man, <clears throat> excuse me, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Why? That they should seek God in hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is not actually far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. When you consider it that way, God has always had a purpose for me. From, from the very beginning of things, from, from the beginning of mankind, he has shown us what he intends for us. Uh, you're studying that this morning in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we're further down, but, but in the first part of that, that book, as Paul opens that letter and writing to those in Ephesus, what does he say about God? He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Stop and think sometimes what that means. I can't certainly name them all, but what are some of the spiritual blessings that we have that we should be so thankful for. How about forgiveness? Redemption. The truth. God's told us what he wants and what he's done for us. Uh, that he sustains us. And, and that, you know, I know that, that I can be forgiven if I have a repentant heart. That's not the case with everyone in this world. You have probably experienced doing something against someone else and they have a hard time forgiving you. Or maybe you're the one that has a hard time forgiving them. Think about the spiritual blessings that God has given us in the things that we have done. He says in verse 4, even as he chose us in him, 
before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us for the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. You think about a purpose that before, you know, Paul says here in another place, it's before the foundation of time, before before things existed the way that we can comprehend that they exist, God had a purpose for us. That's why he created us. We can be certain in that purpose. So all of the uncertainty that I might deal with in life and the things that are going to happen or may happen, I know that I can trust the character of God. I know I can trust his purpose. Peter says it this way, 1 Peter 1 and verse 18, knowing that you are ransomed from feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious, precious blood of Christ. God was willing to give his own son for you. Why? So that you might have the hope of glory, he goes on to say in those last couple of verses there. Think about what an amazing thing it is that we can be so certain in God's purpose that time and time again he has told us that. Here's another one of those verses that sometimes people take out of context a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm certain that he has a plan for my salvation. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, people look at that and say, well, all things work together for good, and so that means everything that happens to me is going to be good, or if I'm a Christian and I follow after God. Let's think about what the context is there and what he's trying to tell us. When you go there to Romans chapter 8 and Paul's writing about things, he's writing about the future glory, he's writing about God's plan from the beginning. Um, and, and, and why they should be, want to be a part of that. And in chapter 8, you can go back to verse 18 and verse 20. It talks about the, the creation being subject to futility and groaning together, waiting for the glory of God to be made full. In other words, for mankind in his sinful state and all the things that have happened for him to, to be glorified and in, in the end to be saved because of what Jesus did. And because God adopts us as sons. He gives us the full benefits of, of being heirs, even though we were outside of, of him and we were, we were foreigners. And he says in verse 26, the spirit helps us. It helps us, uh, the, breath, the very breath of God is what that word is there. The spirit helps us understand and pray as we ought to, and it intercedes for us, and, and that it searches our hearts and minds according to the will of God. And then he says in verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for, for good for, for those who are called according to his purpose. I've said it already a couple of times in this lesson. Maybe your purpose in this life is to suffer that God might be glorified or that others might be led to him. You may not consider that a good life, but God would. If you're doing it for him and if you're living for him. And if you can appreciate that he has a plan for your salvation. We live in a blessed country in a luxurious time. But if you didn't live here in the United States of America, and you lived in a place that persecuted people who believed in God, this verse would probably mean something else to you. Probably mean something else as you think about that you can still have certainty in God's purpose, even though you might suffer in physical life. He says in verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. Those who, he's talking about people who are going to be willing to give themselves to him. That's what he's talking about there when he talks about predestination. Uh, you know, those whom he predestined, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. We can be made right and just and, and have glory to God if we have certainty in his purpose. And we can appreciate uh, appreciate what it is that, that he does for us. I mean, very quickly to support that, what does Peter say? 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count it, but is patient towards you. He doesn't want us to perish. He desires that we, be, that we come to repentance. Paul says in Romans 2 and verse 4, do you presume the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? He's looking for those who are willing to give themselves to him. And the other thing, the, the last thing then that we can be certain about as we consider that is God's justice. We can be certain about his character, we can be certain about his purpose, and we can also certainly uh, be certain about his justice. We see how much God values true justice. What, what, is, 
the verse that we all know well in Micah, in verse, chapter 6 and verse 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God? And appreciate what it means to be able to do those things, to, to see how much God values justice. The proverb writer says in, in verse 20, chapter 28, verse 3, evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. In other words, we need to appreciate and love justice because that's what kind of God we serve. And we can be certain about that. Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19 to, to allow justice to come through God. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Because oftentimes we want to bring justice for ourselves. But be certain that God is a God of justice. We walk justly before him and he will reward us accordingly. And so as we think about that, realize that the, the time will come for justice. If we are following after God and, and, or not, the time will come. The trumpet will sound. God has told us that will happen and we can trust and believe that it will. Peter says the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When the heavens pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. It's hard for us to imagine that sometimes when we're used to how things go and used to, to getting up the next morning and things are going to be how we think they're going to be. Remember what God has promised and said. And if we can trust him about all those other things and we want to have good trust in his character and say, well, you know, God will do the best thing for me and God is a good God, God is a God of justice as well. And he tells us that if these things are going to happen, what kind of people we ought to be is the last part. Uh, of what he says there in that verse. Paul writes it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. I mean, these can be exciting words for you. They can be chilling words for you. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the, love, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we shall be changed. We can be certain about God's justice. We can be certain that those things will come. And as we think about that, we can be certain who the Lord is and that his justice will be unquestionable. Romans chapter 14 and verse 11 Paul very simply says, As it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess to God. In 1 Thessalonians, or to the Thessalonians, a couple of places, he writes this, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with cry of command, and with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those, then those who are alive, those who are, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. I like how as Paul writes about these things here and in other places, he gives encouragement to those who are looking forward to that, and warning to those uh, who are not following after God. That last verse, last verse we'll consider this morning as we think about that and we kind of put all of this together is, is here where he talks about this is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you might be worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering and he talks about that there will be vengeance for those who go against God but there is eternal glory in the verses we've seen previous to this for those who are willing to give themselves to God and so what I encourage you to think about this morning in all of this is the certainty of God there is certainly uncertainty in life, but we can be sure about God's character and who he is. We can be sure about his purpose and what he wants for us, and we can be sure about his justice. And knowing those things and knowing the certainty uh, that exists in God hopefully will drive us, motivate us to be the kind of people that are glorifying to him, the kind of people that are lights to others, uh, to also bring glory to him. I encourage you this morning to think about your standing before God and where you are with that. If you have never made those first steps to, to, to walk after him, to be baptized into Christ, think about the certainty you can have in your life by doing that. Maybe you've taken those steps and stepped off the path and you need to find your way 
back to the rock. Would you consider doing that this morning? Is there a way that we can help you do that? Would you let us know how by coming to the front? I'll be standing and sing this song. For your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white. 